Hello and welcome. Parts Talk is back with another episode in the series My Dealership Experience. Today we talk with Artilio Carganello. Artilio is a fun-loving and passionate master technician for Lexus and Toyota. It's well worth the listen. You can find the full video of this interview on my YouTube channel, Parts Manager Professional. Remember to like and share this podcast. Also listed in the description is our information on how to make a donation. Let us begin. Artilio, welcome. I'm glad you took the opportunity to to join me on this journey so we can explore individuals oh, yeah individual stories insights experiences that you can share for others to know and understand exactly what takes place in the auto industry right and my my mission is to bring about the awareness of the individuals who work behind the scenes who make it possible for families to be safe right um logistically we're you have a lot of truckers, drivers who deliver, do deliveries. You have Uber drivers now who make it, make it convenient to even deliver food, right? Yeah. To need the people, especially now in this time of the COVID, a lot of people now rely on Ubers and Lyft and, you know, the gig economy who rely on their, their motor vehicle. Their motor vehicle right now is the main asset that keeps, that keeps food on the table, right? But at the same time now, we have to pay homage to individuals like yourself who work behind the scenes diligently and have the wealth of knowledge to know exactly what needs to be done, you know, to make everyone feel safe, right? So this is like, a, you know, um, a thank you scenario for individuals such as yourself. <laughs> I know it may, it may be a little bit overreaching, but at the same time, no, this is some, some way of paying back the respects for certain individuals. But I tell you, um, enough of the rambling about me. Let us let us get into the story. T- tell us a little about yourself. Well, let's see. I started my apprenticeship at a dealer. It was called York Toyota. That was back in October of 1992. Okay. And about it took me about a year to get registered as an apprentice. Okay. I mean, I always knew I was going to go into cars. I loved cars and since you know grade nine automotive class i took automotive every year basically i that i could mm-hmm. i always loved cars yeah um, so i knew it was you know pretty much early on i was going to be a mechanic or something along with automotive yes yes um so in the first year when i after i got registered i did a toyota map program which was 38 weeks of straight school Um, it was the second year Toyota had offered it. So you went to Centennial College, you had dedicated Toyota trained teachers, but really being their second year, they didn't really have Toyota knowledge. They were teachers who had been at Centennial College for years. Right. They were a branded Toyota teacher. So, yeah. Um, but you know, we had a lot of Toyota books and this was geared towards, um, just technicians who were working at Toyota dealers, Mm -hmm. you know, apprentices, not technicians, apprentices were at Toyota dealers Yeah, and give them more Toyota experience than, you know, the general domestics that they had, um, to learn off. So we had donated Camry and a donated, uh, Corolla to work on and, Personally, for me, I wasn't a big Toyota guy, but after years of working at Toyota, you know, I was there till it changed. I think 95 became Dave Nichols Toyota. Okay. Okay. Out York Toyota, Mm -hmm. new owner came and he changed everything up. Yeah. And Dave Nichols Toyota, I left 99 to go to Woodbridge Toyota, which was a lot closer to where I lived. Okay. So living with my parents, you know, um, 20, geez, 25 now <laughs> at the time, 25 at the time. Yeah. And, you know, being close to my parents was a lot better. Yes. You know, I can go to work and come home for lunch. Mm-hmm. You know, it was great. So, but it was, it was actually took me a while to become an apprentice. I tried for about six months after I finished high school yeah. to get an apprentice. They just weren't hiring apprentices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I started at a garage for three days. And then he said, I have no work. So I got to let you go. Yeah. 
I worked in the shop for three days. I didn't really do anything. And then he says, I got to let you go. Yeah. So it was a really, it was a tough time to get into that trade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then especially to sign up, people didn't want apprentices. They wanted licenses, guys. Yes, yes. Because I, I remember back then, in, in the, before 1995, uh, a motor car was a, a well, I wouldn't say a scarce commodity, but there, there, if you compare then to now, it's it's really wasn't as much. So they they didn't have time to use you know the little guy to come in to 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 train them on all these things. They just wanted persons to come in, fix a car, the car go, because that, that, at that time you didn't have much cars coming in in order for the amount of work to be shared amongst the the amount of individuals that were there. Well, and also the fact that you're working on an import, you know, there wasn't many Toyotas, there wasn't many Hondas, it was all the big three. Yes. You had a lot of Ford and you had people who were, you know, lifelong Ford, lifetime Chevrolet, Mm -hmm. lifetime Dodge people. Yes, you know, yes. So, you know, because yeah, back was, then, back then the car, the car would stay in the family for like generations. It handed down from the grandfather to the son, and then you know, from and then the son and uh, the father will hand it down to his son. So it's three gener- three generation of cars. Yeah, and your nineteen eighty nine Corolla would run out in, a, in you know less than five years, and you'd be getting another Corolla. Yes, yes. This, they lasted mechanically. But the bodies were still pretty bad. Yeah. A lot of yeah. rusting issues back yes. then. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I stayed with Toyota. I basically, my whole career was with Toyota. I went to Woodbridge. And when I went there, I was able to become a pro technician with through training at, you know, going to the head office. And um, from there, 2003, I ended up, buying my first house, getting married and starting at another dealership in Mississauga because I got a better offer. Right. All in the same month, October, 2003, put my down payment on my house, moved in in a month, got married at the end of the month. And I started after a week yeah. after I got married all right. in that month. It was crazy time. But uh, Mississauga <laughs> was uh, one of the only dealers that actually had a union okay okay unionized shop and everything was different from everything i learned yeah you know you had to take a union mandated break at 10 o'clock you know there were a specific time when you had to take your lunch one team mm-hmm. went at 11 30 to 12 another team went from 12 to 12 30 and another team went from 12 30 to 1 and you mm-hmm. had to stick to that lunchtime yeah you, your break time at three o'clock it was you have to stop working there were a set of rules that i never experienced before <laughs> yeah. yeah as it go on, as you go along yeah um things and time changes yeah yeah it was a environment, yeah and you know even with the people who were who had been in the dealership for years being unionized you kind of you kind of had to go with them you couldn't be an individual in a unionized shop right but you had much better benefits and it was tough to want to give up those benefits to maybe be a better individual Mm -hmm. but totally different experience it's uh unionized became you know, there is a brotherhood of unionized members and yeah. that kind of took precedence over customers because mm-hmm. there were so many rules. Every day you'd get a memo on what you can and can't do. And do, yeah. So there was a whole issue with, you know, people coming to try and get break up this union that had been there since 68. Okay. Before. Mm-hmm. So, and there was still staff the two parts guys had started 68 69 and there were two technicians who had been there since 1970 (laughs) been there and before i was born Mm -hmm. i you know you guys were at working at this dealership which was you know previous dealer yeah usually usually parts guys parts guys they don't they don't go anywhere right 
Um, that's what I've noticed when I see, when I've worked at different dealerships in the past, you will go there and you'll have at least two or three guys who actually started with the company. And after 20 years, they're still there. It, it is hard to get a good parts guy. Mm-hmm. One who knows exactly what needs to be done. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sometimes you can pull a kid off the street and get stuff done, but a good knowledgeable parts guy is hard to find. So if they do know what they're doing, they do stay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess it, it's not easy. I mean, you know, parts guy will have a, if he gets the wrong part, the technician can give him the bad information or there's a work order with the bad VIN number. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the technician chooses out the parts guy. Yeah. Or if a customer over the counter gets the wrong part or something's not what they like, yeah. that parts guy gets chewed out. So I've seen parts guys get chewed out for a lot of stuff. For a lot of stuff. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is common because the before all this technology in parts, like the electronic parts catalog, they have manual catalogs. They have to look up the information in the manual catalogs, right? And then they had the bin cards. Then they have to go to the bin cards and look at the information there. And because inventory was done manually as, as well, because they have to like, when you sell an item, you have to update that card to ensure that the, the, the right quantity is in the location. And then you go around the back and then you have to manually look for these items. So it's, 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 it's been a an evolution so to speak <laughs> of where yeah of where parts is coming from com- to to where it is right now everything is is computerized you know what it has been a blessing toyota has gone through a lot of changes with their parts the best thing that they have now is if we don't have it the dealers are connected to each other mm-hmm. so they can see which dealers have, have the it. part yeah. how much quantity it does save a lot of time of phoning around and, oh, do you have this part? Here's this part number. Oh, I'm on hold. So, yes, they are progressing, but it's still a slow, it's still a <laughs> slow pace. Progress. Yeah. May or maybe because I wouldn't say that. So I would play devil's advocate here. Maybe because we're living in a microwave society. Everything, everybody wants everything instant. Because, as let, let's say, for instance, we live in North America, right? Toyota is one of the leading manufacturers now. The way they do things, their their logistics is impeccable. But at the same time, no. But at the same time, no. What yeah. is happening is that you can get your parts within three days. Right? You can get your parts within three days. Whereas other dealerships, other manufacturers, it still takes them more than a week to acquire a certain part. Right? It takes then, actually longer. Or it takes actually longer. Or there is a there is a, a system now, even though it takes three 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 days, a maximum of three days, and you it, it's um overnight for emergency parts. There are certain sections of the world right now it still takes more than two weeks to get a part. So I, I still think that the North America is just basically spoiled. That's just my that's just my um humble opinion. It's an a society where we have to have it now and waiting yes. 10 minutes is considered a problem. Exactly, exactly. And then you, you, if you go to certain sections of the Caribbean or Africa or anywhere else, the, the Asia, right? It takes 21 days to 28 days to get, a, to get apart by air freight. Wow. Yeah. I guess I am spoiled. <laughs> you know, for, us, for us, a week and it's like, oh my God, we got to wait a whole week. Yeah. And I think that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did twenty-one days, twenty-eight days to get. Apart. Yes, yes. That's what. That's what. That's what. That's what it was like, less than five years ago. That's basically what it was, right? But you know, with the with the advancement of logistics, and now there you can have a hub in Miami or a hub in in New York or somewhere else. It makes it easier to you know transship across the border. But anyway, that, that's a whole different story. Please continue <laughs> because I'm sure you have far more. You see, the more you talk, it comes over into, into, in, into my special area and then we can communicate just, just the same. It only goes to show, the, yeah, it only goes to show the wealth of information you have. <laughs> I love it, man. Now continue. Well, I, honestly, I, I, my life has been in a dealer. 
I haven't really done anything outside a dealer except for those three days when I first started. So trying to get as much knowledge has always been more beneficial, you know, learning from the advisor, seeing how they do things. And even with parts, you know, a couple of times when there's no parts guy around, I learned to use the computer so I can look up a part and I can explain to them, Hey, here's the bin. I put it in. This is the yeah. part I need. Yeah. Everybody saves time mm-hmm. instead of having to wait. But you're, I mean, you're, maybe- you're, you're one of the, you're one of the patient and understandable one. Then you have those technicians who will just come and beat down the rear counter. Where's my part? Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it. It just, it's not a good environment when you have people like that. Yeah. I know the nature of our business is to serve the customer and everybody wants their customers served the best and the fastest. Yeah. It can't always be that way. There are always going to be some type of problem that will arise where, you know, the part order didn't come in or the Mm. part order that's wrong or that part didn't fix it. Yeah. You know, because you're, the mentality is the faster I get this car out of here, I'm on to the next one to do the next job. Mm-hmm. So it's been good and bad, but I think for the most part, even as technicians, you see, you know, in the multiple dealers that I've been, it's, you're going to have your good and your bad. And it's that mix that if you can have a good flow of systems and you learn okay, you know what the advisor's doing, you can help an advisor, or you can help a parts guy. Mm-hmm. The flow would be a little bit easier as opposed to I just sit here and wait and bitch and moan. Or I'll just, you know, throw a temper tantrum where the customer is and it looks, the whole dealership looks down upon, yes, right? Yes, yes. And at the same time, that, that is a part of the, the environment, as you say, if, and the strategy that the leadership is using within the company, within the dealership, right? If they are customer centric, customer satisfaction focused, and the paramount about the the mission, the vision, the value is respect for people, then you won't have that continuous clash between parts and service and sales and all that. They look at the the overall goal of the dealership to know that you know customer satisfaction is, is number one. It's our priority. And when you work when you work in collaboration with each other in a friendly and respectful manner, then everything else will flow freely. That's your goal. Yes. Well, if, we always try, right? <laughs> I know, I know, but you know, sometimes you know, it's, it's difficult because of the different um, personalities that are around, right? And that's just where, basically where it is. Yes. But you you went into you know, the changes that you've seen, and um, we also went into the the experiences and the scope the, um, based on where you are now. But tell us what were some of the biggest challenges you faced while while you know honing your skills during that time. One of the things, the biggest things I found is that. Because I've moved to other dealers, you know, maybe this dealer wasn't working out and I could found a dealer that was hiring for more money. You know, usually a dealer doesn't want to give you money. So you move to another dealer. Yeah. And give you more money. But how everybody, every dealer I found always does things differently. Mm -hmm. It's the way they've done it. And it's hard for that dealership to change. I, I, it, it's, I don't know why they don't, if somebody comes in new and say, Hey, I have an idea. Yeah. We don't try that because we don't want to do that. Here. Really? Without even giving it a, Hey, maybe we can try it out and see if it works. Every dealer I've been to, they will always say, no, this is the way we do things. And you have to get into that groove of how we do things. Here. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the individual mindset because one of the, one of the, what do I call it now, popular phrases for Toyota is continuous improvement. So, I mean, if you're talking about, um, a con- yeah, if you're talking about a, a Toyota dealership in particularly, and it is challenging when you're there and they don't want to try new things to see if it works or not, then it is not the, it is not the system. It's, it's the, it's the person, it's the leadership of that dealership, 
right? That is that is where the problem lies. I would say one dealer, Northwest Lexus, my first Lexus dealer, they were always trying to make improvements. We would have every Friday a circle. They called it Lexus Circle. All the service staff would get together to circle and they would explain some of the things that have happened for the past week mm-hmm. and what they were going to do to actually, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to, okay, we're, you know, we're not emailing customers anymore. We're going to just do phone, whatever they did. They tried every week. We did a Lexus circle right. as the mall was kind of ah, not another stupid circle. I want to work type of thing, but mm-hmm. believe it or not, it made it a little bit nicer because, Hey, it's so-and-so's birthday next week or yeah. it's, you know, so-and-so's anniversary. Sometimes you don't get those human connections with other people because right. as a mechanic, Hey, I got to work and I'll maybe talk to the guy next to me, but everybody yeah. else, you know, I'm going to deal with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we did have a little more human connection. I found if the dealership tries to get some type of interaction with its employees, but for the most part, it's always been a individual at a dealership. Yeah. You know, the not so much would they, you know, maybe they throw a pizza party here and there, you know, or they had a catered event one time to celebrate something, mm-hmm. but that's still not the same as some level of human interaction with each other that dealerships don't really have because it's, yeah. it's kind of cutthroat where, if you're not working on the car making money, somebody else is taking your work. <laughs> yeah, that is a that is a culture itself. That is a culture, right? That is a and culture. And it's been around since, geez, I, I believe, seventies or the eighties. I know people were flat rate back then. Yeah. The uh, I love this story. A guy that I used to work with at Mississauga. When he started as an apprentice in 75, the door rate was $10 an hour. And he was paid $4 an hour as a mechanic. Yeah. yeah. So the, they were getting 40% share of the door rate. Okay. So now the door rate, here we are, 2021, a door rate of $150 is an average for a dealership. Okay. And most techs are around $30. So that market, that percentage we had of the door rate has gone down over the years. Mm -hmm. The door rate's been going from when I started, they were at $90, $95, if I remember. And it kept creeping up $10 a year here, $20 Mm -hmm. a year, you Mm -hmm. know, it kept creeping up. Yeah. But the calories barely changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But most, if you talk to people who don't know mechanics, when they go to the dealer and they see $150, they say, wow, the technician gets $100 an hour. No. <laughs> no. They, it's, no. It's a perception. Yeah, it is. And, in, and I found when the dealer wants to give the customer a break, they tend to say, okay, well, I won't charge her for that. As opposed to, so I'll do the work for free so you don't have to charge a customer instead of, say, making her pay $100 an hour as opposed to 150. Right. So you get a little a little bit of tug of war between what dealerships want to pay between the mechanic and the customer. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit of a, um, not tug of war, but I don't want to cut my profits out. So, and I don't want to lose the customer. I want to give them something to make them happy. And where yeah. is it going to come from? You know, go from the technician. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Is is maybe the answer going to not have flat rate? Do we go back to how I I know there are dealerships. It I have a few people who worked out like Walkerton, Goderich area, uh-huh. and they're not flat rate. They're just straight time, but they don't have, you know. 30, 40 cars a day, 50 right. when it's really, you know, they don't have the same number of clientele that GTA dealers have. 
Right, right, right. So, yeah, so it's easier for them to just pay them um, a straight a straight salary because they know they already know what their appointment system is for the for for on their schedules are for weeks and months to come because they yeah they, yeah they capitalize on their UIO which is the total units in operation which is which is if you're out in the rural area you already you already know exactly how many cars are out there. So they're all they they're able to forecast their their sales and their budget yeah. from yeah for the rest of the year on a yearly basis, right? That is how it is done there. But uh, let me move on to the next question. Yeah, I'm interesting because a lot of people don't even understand this this um, flat rate flat rate system or the labor rate system and how, how much is charged. At the end of the day, the customer gets a big bill. They cry about it, but if once the, the service writer, the service advisor goes around the back and start negotiating with the manager or whatever, they, and then the, the mechanic is the one who always loses out, right? His, his money is going to be cut. And then the parts, yes. parts is cut as well because you're going to be offering a discount on the part, not taking in consideration also the, the cost of sales that, that was required to bring that part in. So... That is why we have these programs, Atilio, so, so persons can understand exactly the dynamics that takes place within the dealership, right? Uh, it is yeah. what it is, right? But, I mean, currently, what are, what are, do you, did that challenge now, are you, are you working around it? Have you put it behind you or you just, you just move on to the, to, to the, to the next dealership that's, that is offering more money? Well, I think I'm at a place at a dealership right now that's actually sees the value of an employee who goes a little bit above beyond what the minimum they ask for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where I work right now, most of the staff has been there for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. There's a few technicians who are into their mid sixties and their speed is not what the dealership requires. Right. But you, you, you can't kick somebody out just because they're not as fast. Yeah. So they do have, a, they do have staff. Loyalty is very big to this dealership. And mm -hmm. because maybe I'm not at that level where they are, where I'm tired all the time, or I just want easy work, I can still go a little bit above and beyond what oh, I'm beyond, capable yeah. of. And, yeah, and help out and, and carry most of the load. Yeah, so they see it, management sees it, the advisors see it, and it's generated back where I'm never going to be losing out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I have to do something for free, they're, they're, they've always been able to get my back and give me some time here and there. Right. Which I've never had that happen in another dealer. This is the first time a dealership's done this. So there, there are good dealers out there. <laughs> that's basically, that's basically what, is, what you're saying. Yeah. I, I found that this dealership, there does carry a little bit less stress. Mm -hmm. But in the trade-off, they don't have as much customers. Their customer base is less than other dealer. Yeah. So I make less money in turn. Whereas the other Lexus dealer was, was very high volume. A lot of cars, yeah. high stress, high stress, and yeah. I was, I was making more money, but way more stress. Way more, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's sometimes the stress is not worth it. I tell a lot of people, right? I worked at a company for fifteen years, and it was so stressful, right? You have to you, every day it's about the numbers, every month it's about the reports, every every quarter is about traveling to another another country or a region and give workshops and conferences and it was just high stress and the customer volume and dealing with staff and dealing with passengers dealing sorry not passengers customers um dealing with dealing with other other aspects of the the businesses and the 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 sublets and the franchises and then i found that when i left and went to another dealership the volume wasn't as high right the pay wasn't as the same actually I got a pay cut, but at the same time, no, it was so much more relaxing, you know, being able to do what you love in a more comfortable atmosphere, right? And I found that 
the management at this this other job that I that I went to, they were more accommodating. They will sit, they will listen. They'll say, "What is it? Anything that you need, just let us know, right?" And you get the you get the budget to do what you want. And then they see the value of you bringing in more business. And the more business you bring, they said, "Okay, that is exactly what they want to see, right?" Um, you are the captain of your ship, whatever you want to do, make it happen. You get that sense of comfort and they reassured you and, 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 and then it, it boosted your confidence, right? It actually boosted it your makes confidence. A manager or someone who's high up enough can actually um, credit you with actually being able to say, hey, thank you very much. I'm, yeah. I'm happy for what you did instead yeah. of saying, yeah, I saw you were late one day. Yeah. You know, focus on the positives, and I guarantee you that brings out the good in people who are, would be willing to go further than pointing out the negatives. Yeah, definitely. You know, no one's per- but I, I, I personally respond better to positive criticism mm-hmm. than pointing out any negative cri- cri- yes, criticism. Yes, yes. And I found, I found, I find that with dealerships who handle high volume it's it's a very stressful environment right they they say work hard and play harder but i i i think that's uh that's all a facade if you if you if you if you know, if you know what i'm saying because the more the more money they make um someone at the top wants more they want a, a different lifestyle and then they're going to pressure you to 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 actually bring in more and do more if you're servicing 20 cars per day. Hey, can you do 25? <laughs> so, the, so the numbers keep going up. <laughs> actual, the actual numbers. I think, I'm guilty of that too. I think I'm guilty. You know, I could have had one day I made, you know, 18 hours and then I'll be bitter because, oh man, I could have had 20. Mm-hmm. Really, it's negligible. It's yeah. two hours, you know, and you're in your paycheck. You won't see that difference. No, no, you won't. But the mentality of it, oh, you know what? I made this this amount of hours I want it every day. Yes. And then, you know, you have days when you go home with six or seven because there was just, you know, one warranty job that really knocked you down because it just didn't pay. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. 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 It happens. It happens. But based on your, based on your many years of experience, what, what will be some of your recommendations to, to dealerships now? Um, I mean, we, we have spoken about the, the strategies, the attitude, the, the morale, the motivation, um, the, the, the overall operations itself. But what, what are your personal views in terms of how would you recommend dealerships going about, you know, making it more comfortable for staff, but at the same time, know what other awareness would, would you recommend for them to know that for just the everyday customer to appreciate what goes on around the back? Well, I think part of the problem we have right now is there's nobody coming into this trade. It's really hard to get younger people. Mm -hmm. Basically, we've been looking for a technician for almost a year because the the only people that have been responding to any job placements are people who are not in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they don't have any dealership experience. They may have had some car experience. Yeah. Dealership is not like working at a garage. It is totally different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Garage at a garage, you you don't have to be as specialized. You're basically doing just maintenance work. Yeah. Whereas a dealer, you gotta, especially with the technology coming up. I mean, you know, there was a installing Apple CarPlay and all these new models. Yeah. You know, you had you had to do a reflash program specifically, otherwise you ruin the hard drive in the radio unit and you're replacing it. Yeah. But um to go back a little, you touch on the point that trying to get the younger generation to come in, apprentices, so to speak, but why can't the dealerships or the association that is responsible for these individuals, they need to make it more attractive? Because I've worked at dealerships here in toronto and the turnover rate for apprentices are so high all because they're not getting they're not getting compensated i know in the old days you had to pay to learn 
And that's basically what it is. Yes. You're, you're an apprentice for a year and a half, two years, and you only get a stipend, right? And, and you're lucky if you, if, if you actually get a stipend. You have to walk with your own lunch, walk with your own fear to get back home, everything. You pay yourself to learn. But in I, today's... Had to for, I even got registered. Yeah. They won't even register you. So that's another, that's okay, you get the job, but you still have to get registered to make it count towards e- being a mechanic. Exactly, exactly. So you, it's just that you can't blame them because of the system that is in place, right? You need mechanics, but so for instance, the ones that are overseas, there are experienced master technicians who, who live overseas in the Caribbean. I'm going to use the Caribbean because that's, that's my background. And they want to come to Canada. But when they come here, they still have to do the Red Seal exams. <laughs> right? They have to do Red Seal exams. They have to. Oh, yeah. I thought they would. They still have accredited from where they are, though. They don't count it? Yeah, they count it. It only, it only counts as a competence. It doesn't count as a pass. Ah, okay, okay. Right? So when they come in, what they do is they have to register register here and then they have to get their transcript to say okay they worked with a, a so i'm going to use toyota again they worked with a toyota back and they have to get that recommendation or that letter or whatever whatever and then they have to get the transcript of the the um the various programs that they under that they did back then because as you know every dealerships have their program that they register the technicians and they go through the various steps and various grades on various the various levels of 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 matrification if you want if you want to call it that they have to transfer that over so they can move it to a different level but they still have to come here and do classes and take the red seal exams and then when they take that exams then they get into a dealership then they have to understudy somebody else before they can before they can be known as a certified technician but the system may have changed a little bit but i interviewed um a guy named oliver he he had to do his exams when he came here and he's working at a dealership um, in Manitoba as we speak, but it was challenging for him to get into the system. Wow. No, I, I did not realize how hard it was. Yeah, it is. It is. So we want people, but we have these barriers in place and uh, to make it, you know, challenging for people who want to apply their trade. That's basically what it is. Right. And you saw, you saw, you saw the, you saw the um the turnover rate for your 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 knowledgeable of the turnover rate amongst amongst apprentices in dealerships. It's just high. It's very, it's relatively yeah. high. They don't last. I mean, the money is still at a minimum wage almost. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, and it it is hard and dirty work. And you know, you'll get a mechanic who's a little rough and rough, and maybe they're yelling at you you know, a little more than they really need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, an apprentice helps me with balancing the tires or lifting them up. Say thanks. Yeah. You know, and other guys, like, they don't even say a word. Just, I want you to do this. Do this Mm -hmm. for me. Do this for me. Yeah. And then they sit down and they're they're looking at their phone watching the movie while the apprentice is doing the job. And they don't even (laughs) know what's happening. Yeah. 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 Because you you have you have those technicians who take a, they take advantage of advantage of the system. That's basically what it is. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere <laughs> I went, it happens. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's it, it's tricks in trades, but you're dealing with personalities, you're dealing with people. And you know, it's it's it is what it is, but the thing is it it's it's a revolving door. It's a revolving door in the trade. Right, but um, but I, even for technicians, not just apprentices. I mean, I've seen technicians say, you know, when when they've had enough, that's it. They're totally done working on cars. They don't even want to work on cars anymore. Yeah. The system has made it so horrible for them mm-hmm. because of just the constant fighting with other technicians or fighting parts or an advisor. Mm-hmm. They just don't want to do it anymore. They just do something else. Yeah, the, a good example is. You know, I've seen guys who either want to work for the TTC or want to work for the police. Mm, yeah. The Toronto police, they just get into a job like that, Monday mm. to Friday only, 
And if you work extra time, you get overtime. It's just easier. Yeah. Why would you submit yourself to killing yourself to try to make extra hours? And then, you know, sometimes those jobs don't pay very well. Yeah. And there's less maintenance coming up. You don't maintain cards. It's mainly just replacing parts when they break or updating technology. Yeah. You're not doing a lot of servicing anymore. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You're so true. Which which leads me to my next question is that how should we how should we prepare for an ever changing market like that? I mean, it's coming. Remember, oh, it, you 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 go online now and you you can order a car right off the internet. <laughs> That's basically yeah. where it is. Not only that, most of the people that we have, like that are trained technicians who are working, you know, to make their, you know, 12, 14 hour days, they are trained on changing oil, changing brakes, mm-hmm. you know, doing the maintenance stuff. Yeah. In what, 10, 20 years, there will be no more gasoline. It's going to be hybrid only. Mm-hmm. And that technology is is changing to the point where these guys aren't going to be ready. They're going to, there's, I've seen them. They're stuck on a, on a car for a whole day with an, with a hybrid problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You go to school, you do some training, but it's not bringing in a car and diagnosing. It's not the same like it was with gasoline engine. Yes. Because with the, not, with, with, the, with the hybrid, everything has to be plugged in and you're staring at the computer screen instead of, instead of doing real work to go into the engine and take your, your what they call it plastic gauge and you measure and you can take down the um the crankshaft and you know you 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 do your 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 sound testing you put it upon the hoist you have the wheels running you know, those those things are going to be things of the past yeah and i mean i've already seen it where now anytime there's been a problem oh just plug it in and reflash the computer <laughs> right it fixes yeah. a problem yeah yeah. You're, until you're, until you're, the engine check know. lights until the engine check lights come back again. <laughs> hey, don't worry. We'll get up another reflash for it. We'll change it again. <laughs> yeah. We are doing quite a few recalls of just reprogramming. Yeah. Any shifting problem, we're just reprogramming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I see the technology is changing slowly, but it's going towards not having many gasoline engines. I mean, the price of gas going up. Mm-hmm. You know, that's another big factor too. We yeah. got a Tundra coming out that's hybrid, a V6 Tundra hybrid, no more V8s. No more V8s. Wow. The Sienna, Toyota Sienna, you can't buy a gasoline engine. It's only hybrid. Only hybrid. Yeah. I mean, the technology is changing. And I, a lot of European countries, by 2030, there will be no gasoline engine you'll be able to buy, mm-hmm. hybrid or electric only. Yeah, yeah. So wow. North America is definitely going to take longer, but it's coming. I know, I know, I know. The world is changing. We just got, we just have to adopt. Oh, that's the that's the only thing that is constant in life is change, right? That's the only thing that's yeah. constant. So we we have to get on board, and dealerships need to recognize that you have to have the the. The strategies in place, what I call it, the infrastructure. That's the right word. You have to have the infrastructure in place. And the infra- infrastructure means people, because without the people, you can't drive the process. Yeah, better, you need to get the training. That's the problem. Not everybody wants to get that training. You could have a good guy, but if he doesn't want to do something, yeah, it holds the dealership back. But yeah. you, the, you know, if you're going to be in this trade, you're going to have to change. Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, I'm going to say you're still going to have the basics. You know, tires are always going to be rubber. So you're going to be having to change tires and, mm-hmm. you know, brakes. People are going to, th- those aren't going to change, but th- they're lasting a lot longer. Yeah. The, yes, they are. So I think maybe Canada, we're lucky. We get so we get rust, but uh, you see cars in Florida, they their brakes don't rust, so they last a lot longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I I noticed that I came when I came here, we we're just changing brakes, pads and rotors, pads and rotors. You're in the Caribbean, you don't change your brakes for, all, for almost five years. 
<laughs> right? your your rotors never your, your rotors never get changed the mm-hmm. most you will do is you, you take it to the machine shop and have them just, uh, just skim it you skim skim the arm they all the you know the carbon built up on the outside yeah. or the waves that are there and then you're good to go you don't have to change it man it's it's totally different totally different yeah here it's put everything new make it make it better yeah remove and replace like you said earlier that's 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 where we are right now oh yeah 100 percent. yeah <laughs> that's that's the way people are making money just replacing parts just replacing parts but what um what what are your recommendations for the younger generation would you would you try to motivate them to come in i mean seeing that your journey you you you've obviously enjoyed your journey you you, you have a passion for what you're doing what 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 will be your well, recommendation? Every, not every day. <laughs> not every day. I know, I know. But I, you're at a comfortable space right now, obviously, right? Definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. What what would be your recommendation for the younger generation? Uh, would you would you would you would you tell them to come in? Uh, definitely. I mean, you have to love cars to be working on cars. Well, yeah. But a lot of them. A lot of them love cars. Remember, it all starts out with the well doing the. Um, what they call it now, the 360 and donutting in the car in the parking lot and all those guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some of those guys can work on cars, believe it or not. But yeah, but you, you, you have to have some passion to be in the automotive industry if you're gonna work. And maybe you gotta lower those expectations of being uh, for me, I remember the expectations where I see people making a lot of money right away. You come into this trade, you're making lots of money. Yeah. That was kind of, I liked cars and I liked money. So it was perfect to start right away. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you did make money at the beginning right away. But today, now it's not, you're not making the money you used to. Mm-hmm. But if you're coming in young, you have to be able to want to learn. because getting stuck on some type of problem for a whole day. Yeah. And you know what? I remember doing this when I was younger and I could get done in a few hours. You're moving on to the next project. And you know what? You'll feel better when you were able to fix it in a relatively good time. Then I can't fix it. You get somebody else to come over. So getting as much knowledge as you can, I think is the most important part when you're starting out. Yeah. Instead of, Okay, hey, let me do the old change. Let me do this tire swap. And then you see a guy with a problem, but you don't go over and look at it or mm-hmm. see what's happening. Yeah. Not necessarily, hey, let me help, but maybe asking the questions on what or why he's doing it. Yeah. To get that knowledge so that yeah. when the time comes, you have some of that experience because uh, yeah. I see it's changing. You're 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 so you're obviously right. You're 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 hundred percent correct. I remember years back. Remember back then. I, I I I'm not as old as you, but I still have some memory, <laughs> right? Because you back then you had you had specialization. You had the guy who worked on air conditioned, the air conditioning. Then you have the guy who worked on starters and alternators. Then you have the guy who does um wheel alignment Dassey or he... yeah 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 right the wheel alignment now we have master technician who who should know everything however yeah. back to a story about a guy who was just doing auto ac that's all he did evaporator cores condensers starters alternators that was his thing and i turned to him i looked at him and said yo why not learn the other stuff you know back then they used to they used to rebuild engines. You take an engine down, you take out the block, and then you bore and you go 50 millimeter, 20 millimeter, or you re-sleeve, and you have your main bearings, Conrad bearings, the connecting rod, and then you push rods and all these, and you rebuild with the truss washer and your overall kit. That was real mechanic work back then. They don't make engines like, yeah. like they used to because those engines were made of iron, cast iron. Now they're all aluminum, right? Uh, my gosh, if the if this if the temperature probably goes to fifty degrees Fahrenheit, those engines engines will probably blow up and melt right now. But the, the point I'm making, yeah, they're just yeah, they don't they don't make them like yeah, they don't make them like they used to. 
And I asked this guy, I said, yo, why not learn all these things? He said, he can't be bothered. He's comfortable doing his AC work, whatever, whatever, whatever. You fast forward five years later and the, the system changed of how the evaporator core condensers and everything was, uh, was made up, right? When they changed from R12 to R2, R134, they started to make the, yeah. yeah, they started to make it a lot efficient in how the air conditioned operates, right? And then this guy found that he was not getting as much work as, as, as that was coming in. And then yeah. he turned to me and said, years after, he, many years after, I saw him at a party or whatever. And he looked at me and he said, he should have taken your advice. He should have learned mechanics. He should have learned to change even a dispatch. That, that's how bad it was, just to change a regular dispatch, right? So you have to be able to adopt. And one of the things I admired about mechanics, especially the ones who cooperate with each other, and then there's a brotherhood in the, in the, in the shop. They're not afraid to help each other out. You know, you have 20 years experience. You know what it is. Um, you will come over and you will assist the guys in, you know, diagnosing and say, okay, try this way, try that way. This is the right tool to use and, and so forth. So the, the, there is a brotherhood of learning all these things. And it, it has to start with the individual. You have to be willing to learn and you have to have a passion for it. I'll just, I'm just rambling and going on and on, but I, 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 I get what you're saying. There's no way that you'll be able to do everything yourself. There's always going to be a situation where you need somebody to give you a hand or hold this or do something. So yeah. even sometimes you can't, you're staring at the problem and you can't see it. You have to take a step back and somebody can come over and, oh, it's right here. It takes two seconds, but, and it was staring at you in the face. Yeah. So it does happen where you need and need to work together. Yeah. I realize yeah. it's flat rate and it's, it's really hard for the system for you to give up your time to, mm-hmm. for somebody else to make money. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, maybe it's been ingrained when I was in a union shop of working together has always been more beneficial for everyone than. Yeah. making the most hours right yeah yeah it is it is it is it is it is that way or you have the passionate guy who he can't solve the problem and he goes home and he sleeps on it and then he come back in early in the morning as as soon as you turn up he's alone in the garage because the, the shop opens at eight but he's there from six <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's there from six working on the car because he said, you know, he was doing something wrong and he's, he wants to get over it. But those individuals, they are rare, such as yourself, um, who have been in it, who can explain ex- exactly what is going on. And, you know, kudos to you, man. We, we have to, we have to, well, honor, thank you. Yeah, we have to honor and respect the work that you do and, and individuals such as yourself who, who can, who know what it is, right, to, to get the work done. But, I'm going to close off because I don't want to be holding you here and rambling too much and going on and on and on. I'm sure you have a, um, the family to attend to on a nice steak dinner, maybe, <laughs> but you know, I tell you, I want to, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with us. And it has been a pleasure, you know, taking us through, taking us through your journey. And I hope to, no, thank you. You. This was a I'm sorry. Could you repeat? I really I said, no, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It okay. was, uh, it's nice to be able to share experiences with someone else who enjoys them too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I, I have a passion for the auto industry, as, 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 they may, as they may find out, right? It's, it's not all that bad. It's not all that bad. But again, I thank you, Artilio. I, I look forward to, um, to bringing you back because I'm sure you may have more, and many more adventures to share with us, especially now that you're on a new path. I think but I remember <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is but um, get the word out if you know of anyone well any one of your colleagues who would like to come and share their story my, my, my channel is open to, to sit down and listen and it, it's, a, it's a way to the world to see and understand exactly what, what we're doing and your contribution to our industry no, thank you very much. That was great. I will definitely get the word out. And more people we have, the merrier. And hopefully it, it you know, it can shape a newer generation coming in and give them the knowledge to move yes. forward. 
Yes, yes, yes. I'm actually going to bring um, someone next week. Hopefully I can time down. Uh, a mechanic from Jamaica who actually came into the system. He had to do the red seal. He applied, did the red seal and started. And he's now working at a dealership full time here. So I want him to share his story and, and, and let persons know the journey for those who want to travel the same path as he did. Cool. Very interesting. Yes. So we look forward. Okay. Um, thank you again. And um, it has been a pleasure. So do have yourself a good night. You too. Thank you very much. Okay. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Remember to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope you're leaving with a better understanding of the individuals who work in the auto industry. Until next time. 